Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the VCAAC's webinar on uterus transplantation. This webinar is the first session in a multi-webinar series on VCA for the transplant community, the need and the achieved, debunking the myths. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's session. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available on the VCAAC hub and the AST website by next week. Please note that all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archived recording. If you do have a question for our panelists during the webinar, we encourage you to participate by using the questions section in the Zoom webinar. You'll see it says Q&A. Questions submitted via the chat section may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the hub and the AST website following the webinar. Finally, when you do log off, after today's webinar, you will see a link to a short survey to complete. Please fill out this survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn this, I will now turn the session over to Dr. Paige Perrette to begin our presentation. Thanks, Anne. I'd like to thank everyone joining us today, whether it's good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and wherever you are. I'm Paige Porrett. I'm an immunologist and transplant surgeon and the VCA director at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And it's a great privilege today to be able to introduce our two speakers. And I'm gonna begin with the introduction of Dr. Ebby Stewart, who is joining us uh, from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Stewart is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology, and she is the chair of reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the Mayo Clinic. Um, she received her BA in molecular biology from Vanderbilt University and her MD at Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Stewart is an accomplished professor of OBGYN and an expert in uterine fibroid biology and infertility. She has many accomplishments to her, na her, to her name, and she is the founding clinical director of the first comprehensive fibroid center at Harvard Medical School at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, she has uh, multiple NIH funded RCTs comparing uh, different types of fibroid treatments to one another and she serves on several steering committees um, and right now is actually one of the directors for the PCORI funded US fibroid registry. Um, we'll hear I'm sure much more about fibroid biology and its impact in fertility today. Uh, finally, I'll add for Dr. Stewart that she has been a medical actor, editor of the Mayo Clinic Guide to fertility and conception. So this is gonna be an outstanding uh, presentation, I'm sure, very relevant to our audience today. It's also a great privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Lisa Johannesson. Um, Dr. Johannesson is the medical director of the uterus transplant program at the Baylor University Medical Center. And I'm sure that many of us joining know about Dr. Uh, Johannesson's many accomplishments in the field of uterus transplantation. I personally consider her to be one of the global leaders in this field, if not the global leader. Um, and we're gonna hear much about Baylor's contributions to the field of uterus transplantation in just a few minutes. Um, Dr. Johannesson is a specialist in OBGYN. She graduated from the Selgren, I'm sorry, from Karolinska Institute in Stockholm with her medical degree. And she performed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Selgrenska University Hospital in Gothenburg, Sweden. Again, for many in our audience, you will already remember that Dr. Johannesson was a member of the, of the uh, initial clinical trial and architect of that trial alongside Dr. Mads Brandstrom to bring uterus transplantation into uh, the world as a clinical reality for um, human subjects. Uh, Dr. Johannesson is well published in this area and she also has, of course, a great presence on many of our important committees in transplantation. So I'm happy to serve with her in many capacities there. And without further ado, I'll let Dr. Stewart begin her presentation. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more from our audience during the Q&A session a little bit later. 
Thank you, Dr. Port, for such a kind introduction. Um, as Dr. Port said, I uh, have my clinical work centered around infertility and uterine diseases. So this really puts me in a good position to think about alternatives to uterine transplantation. Um, and I have no relevant financial relationships regarded, regarding this topic. Uh, but I framed the talk around a series of questions that I'm often asked. And the first is, why would we even want to perform a uterine transplantation for a non-medical problem like infertility? And I think the simple answer is that um, infertility is a medical problem. Uh, both the World Health Organization, and here's the link to their definition of infertility as a disease of the reproductive system, and there's also a similar definition within the US from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine that infertility is a disease and needs to be appropriately treated. Um, second question I'm often asked regarding um, uterine transplantation is why would we wanna offer uh, this procedure for such a rare problem. And I think this is a huge myth in the field uh, that absolute uterine factor infertility, meaning not having a uterus is relatively common. Uh, studies have estimated that uh, three to 5% of the female population have absolute uterine factor infertility, uh, which roughly means about 50,000 women in the United States at any point in time. Uh, and although most transplants to date have been done for absolute uterine factor infertility, um, that um, there's um, a difference um, in what we're seeing in the United States compared to some other sites in the world. And when the Cleveland Clinic published their first abstract on their initial screening, it really brought this home to me that although most of the transplants to date have been done for women who are born without a uterus or uterine agenesis, this really only made up 26% of the population of the calls that they got. And I think we all underestimate how common hysterectomy is and how often it's done in young women who don't uh, want to have it done or potentially have other alternatives and so if you look at the um, almost 75% of the population seen at the Cleveland Clinic of the women who had a hysterectomy, uh, only 20% had it for a malignant process, about 30% had it as an obstetric complication, and um, over half had it for benign um, gynecologic uh, reason. And I think that this is a true misconception in the field of hysterectomy. And even um, I that work in this field uh, wasn't aware of how prevalent hysterectomy was till I started to dig into the numbers. The lifetime risk of a woman in the United States uh, of having a hysterectomy is 45%. So roughly half of all of us will have a hysterectomy within our lifetime and only 8% are for cancer. So even when you combine uh, women who have uh, breast cancer and have a uterus removed, much less the core uterine, cervix, ovarian, and fallopian tube cancers, that um, results in a minority of the hysterectomies. And most are done for benign gynecologic diseases. And I think this case that was widely publicized in the sports press uh, shows um, what can happen. This is uh, the story of Simone Augustus, who's a WNBA player and Olympic gold medalist. Uh, she um, actually um, had a hysterectomy for uterine fibroid, uh, which was uh, described as being as big as uh, a baby's head. Uh, in the press. And um, when you look at uh, this um, uh, paper um, that was published, uh, that they, uh, the press assumed that the uterus needed to be taken out. And they focused on the fact that she could use surrogate uh, motherhood to have a baby. But this is an accomplished uh, woman uh, who's educated to her uh, choices. Moreover, she lived less than an hour away from our uh, institution where we routinely do 
uh, uterine sparing surgeries for this kind of myomectomy. And here at age 26, she was told she had no other choice. She had to have her uterus removed. And I think that this is an underrepresented problem uh, within the field of gynecology. We also have a relative uterine factor in fertility. So women who have a uterus, but where there is an impediment to fertility. So again, some women have uterine fibroids in place, have had prior surgeries. Other women have intrauterine adhesions or uh, problems either congenital or acquired that make uh, their uterus uh, less than optimally functional. So when you look at the whole spectrum of uterine factor infertility, it does encompass, uh, encompass a number of women. So I think the, the most common question I get is why not just encourage couples to pursue other alternatives to transplantation for building a family? Um, and the two big ones are adoption and gestational carrier pregnancies. And I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So adoption is a common method for family building, uh, but I think people are not aware that the options have changed over the years. Uh, this is the State Department data I uh, pulled when we first started looking at uterine transplantation. And in orange, you see intercountry adoption um, in um, uh, a number of countries and then intercountry country adoption in the United States. And you can see that in both, there was an over 70% drop in um, uh, adoptions between 2004 and 2014. In preparation for this talk, I went to try to get updated statistics and the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute uh, published data from 2018 showing that this further declined. So again, uh, that there was an, another 7% decline in the last year from 2017, and again, 82% since 2004. Um, and again, countries where there used to be widespread adoption um, now are only doing about uh, 100 to 200 adoptions a year, with China still leading the pack. And I think that this doesn't even account for the further decli declines we'll see with the COVID pandemic, where um, intra-country uh, travel and inter-country travel um, is remarkably decreased. Um, I think there's also been a huge change in domestic uh, adoptions, uh, that uh, what we see here is the data between uh, 1991 and um, uh, 2015 about birth rates for adolescents uh, who are typically uh, the women that do place their children for adoption. And you see with um, uh, the ensuing years, a marked um, uh, decline in um, uh, uh, unintended pregnancies as better contraception is available for these young women. So again, ages 15 to 17, 15 to 19, and 18 to 19 um, all had sharp declines over this period of time. And in fact, there's some uh, data showing that with long-acting reversible contraceptives, primarily IUDs and contraceptive implants, that they're much more effective than um, conventional pills, patches, and rings. And this leads um, not only to significantly higher continuation rates um, uh, that you see on the left. So you can't, um, if you have an IUD or an implant, you don't have to worry about getting your monthly refill. And that results on the right in um, much um, lower unintended pregnancy rates with long acting contraception. I think there's also been a big shift in uh, the um, uh, children that are available from adoption. Uh, so again, the State Department has a uh, data for uh, each state, and I chose as an example, my home state of Minnesota, but the trends are very similar across the country. If you looked in 
2005, uh, there, there were roughly a thousand total adoptions annually. And by 2015, this had dropped to less than 200. Uh, but what's interesting is um, the uh, majority of the uh, adoptions took place for infants under one year. Um, and by 2015, um, that there were virtually no babies for adoption. Um, all of the adoptions happened with older children. And again, this trend has continued. Uh, if you look at the congressional um, data from 2018, uh, that there's uh, uh, roughly 400,000 children in foster care, um, and only about a quarter of these are about 120. 5,000 are eligible for adoption. But then the numbers markedly decrease after that. When you go to the children that are actually adopted, only a, roughly 61,000 are adopted. The average wait time is four years. And if you're looking uh, for um, a child to adopt who is not related to you, um, then uh, the um, numbers are even um, much lower. So again, out of the 61,000, roughly half are adopted by the foster family, 35% are adopted by a relative, and again, 26% are uh, nine years or older. So adoption of an infant for an unrelated family member is exceedingly rare in the current environment. We'll also talk for a minute about gestational carrier pregnancies, and I want to touch on definitions. Um, although we, we commonly talk about surrogacy, um, that um, a surrogate here is typically someone who provides the egg and the gestational environment. So um, that's not typically what is done in, develop in the developed world. Although there are rare traditional surrogates, most commonly we're talking about a gestational carrier where the egg is provided uh, typically by the intended parent. Um, this involves going through in vitro fertilization. Uh, so it is very uh, costly and very complicated. Um, it's even more complicated if the gestational carrier is not a friend or a relative who is doing this out of uh, their uh, love and concern for you, uh, but uh, someone that you have found through a carrier agency. So at, uh, it's a most um, uh, straightforward area, very complicated, very expensive. Um, in many uh, countries of the world, uh, gestational carriers are prohibited. Uh, so uh, that actually dates back to the genesis of uterine transplantation in Sweden, since gestational carriers were prohibited there. Um, and even in the United States, where it's not prohibited by law, it's very complicated. Every state is different in terms of its regulations. And so if I'm working in Minnesota with a couple who lives in Wisconsin and their gestational carrier lives in Illinois, it's an exceedingly complex uh, procedure to be able to help them build their family and stay compliant with the laws in all of those areas. So there is um, um, a, a precedent for using family members as gestational, as gamete donors or surrogates, um, as well as um, unrelated individuals as we discussed before. And again, this is uh, something that we've done. This is a a article from our local newspaper in Rochester, Minnesota, about a young woman with pulmonary um, hypertension who uh, is medically unable to carry um, her pregnancy and her mom who carried uh, both um, her son and the new baby uh, to help them build a family. Uh, so it is possible, but uh, exceedingly difficult, uh, even in the best of circumstances. I think it's important also to um, uh, look at some of the evolving literature on how women with uterine factor infertility uh, weigh these risks. Uh, this is a survey that was published um, 
uh, in 2016 of women with absolute uh, uterine factor infertility uh, from um, a survey based in London um, and uh, looking at the variety of options available to them. Uh, so uh, looking at the uh, risk to uh, the woman um, in terms of uh, uh, how she wants to build her family. And uh, this survey found that over 90% of women preferred uterine transplantation to adoption or surrogacy. And one of the reasons why uh, this is uh, clear is that uh, women that are thinking about a pregnancy are very attuned to the gestational environment uh, that their uh, child is developing in. And so that's always been a concern. Uh, so again, if you're adopting, you don't know uh, what the birth mother uh, did during her pregnancy. Was she a smoker? Uh, was she using alcohol or um, um, recreational drugs? Uh, the same thing can be true of a gestational carrier, and often that's built into the contracts uh, about what you will do. Uh, but increasingly, there's also evidence that the gestational environment causes epigenetic changes that influence the expression of the genes in the um, fetus, uh, which can have lifelong uh, implications. So I think uh, this has become more and more a focus of many of the women uh, that I care for. The Cleveland Clinic also did a mixed method study of women with um, uh, absolute uterine factor infertility that were exploring uh, this as an option. And uh, they clearly found that um, having absolute uh, factor infertility was a life framing experience and a uterine transplantation was a, a real means uh, to gain control of reproductive autonomy, uh, something that is hard to quantify, but is exceedingly important to women. And I think we um, forget that uh, there are many um, options for men to have reproductive and sexual autonomy uh, that also carry with, risks with them. If you look at the side effects of Viagra and related um, uh, medications, uh, that there are life-threatening um, uh, side effects to these medications, uh, yet uh, men are given the autonomy to choose to use these both for reproductive function and for sexual function. And clearly, even before the advent of uh, these medications, there were a, var a variety of procedures done with penile implants uh, that are still uh, sometimes done that carry with them substantial side effects. Uh, but yet the fact of being able to have reproductive and sexual autonomy um, is thought to be a core value that we um, um, enjoy uh, and should be able to pursue. Um, and I look back on the history of where we've been, uh, that uh, in vitro fertilization is a core part of my professional work, and it's a core um, treatment for uh, many couples worldwide. And when it was introduced in the 70s, there was quite a bit of controversy about uh, this. Uh, Kenneth Ryan, um, who was one of the founding uh, uh, members of the reproductive endocrinology field and also a noted ethicist and one of my former mentors, uh, really uh, tried to uh, frame uh, this new technology um, as uh, being an important uh, goal for women and that the introduction of new technologies he framed as meeting the ultimate moral standard uh, if children um, are uh, conceived with a loving family and that uh, no one was exploited in the process. And so as I look at the field of uterine transplantation, the echoes and controversies of IVF um, come back to me. So that's a brief introduction to some of the alternatives, but let me turn it over to my colleague who will now update you about where we are with, with uterine transplantation. Thank you very much, Ebi, for that fantastic presentation. I very much enjoyed it. 
Uh, I hope you all can see my screen now, and uh, I will continue to talk about the uterus transplantation, the current status internationally and uh, uh, nationally as well, and the outcomes. I have no uh, disclosures. And the layout for my presentation, I'm going to start with, we're talking about the history of uterus transplantation. I'm going to talk about the current status in the world, in the United States, go over quickly the outcomes that we have had in the United States so far, and also touch base on the limitations to wider use. So the first transplantation of a uterus in modern times, I say modern times because there were actually a, an attempt to uterus transplantation in Germany in the 30s, but the first in modern times was at two, in 2000 in Saudi Arabia. This was a case where they used a the uterus from a living donor and it would transplant it into a recipient that had lost her uterus in childbirth. Unfortunately, the graft had to be removed after three months due to thrombosis of the vessels. Uh, then it took 11 years until the next attempt, and that was done in Turkey. And uh, you can see the recipient uh, on your, your right hand side with her doctor. This was the first deceased donor uterus transplantation. Uh, they struggled a lot. Uh, she had repeated miscarriages. And then eventually, nine years after the transplantation, she actually gave birth last year to preterm uh, neonate. The first clinical trial started in 2012. This is my former center in Sweden. Prior to the start in 2012, we had almost a decade of animal studies. We went through uh, rodent studies, we went through larger animals before we actually started doing the surgery in humans. It was nine women uh, that underwent the transplant. All of them had living donors. All the donors were related to the recipients. Out of these nine patients, six ended up giving birth. And the first birth, you see the baby on your right-hand side, uh, was in 2014. He is now, in September, he turned seven. Uh, so you can see a more recent picture of him and his mother uh, down below. This clinical trial with that good success rate led to that more, more centers wanted to start uterus transplantation worldwide. And as of now, we have about 100 cases reported from, from the rest of the world uh, and approximately 30 to 35 babies born of uterus transplantation, at least that has been reported. Uh, there is a majority of the donors are living donors, which is a little bit different from other organ transplantations where, where, the, where the ground, where the base is usually deceased donors. Uh, importantly, the children seem to be developing normally. Uh, in saying that, though, it's important to remember that we only have seven years follow up since 2014 when the first baby was born. And the problem with this, you can see that we have centers in four different continents. A lot of these centers have only sporadic cases of uterus transplantation, few centers has a series, and there's also no functioning registry uh, that keeps track of all the reports. So you usually have to go, when you look at the reports, you have to go to each single case report and try to extract data from there. So before I come into the outcomes and the status in the US, I just want to touch briefly on what is a uterus transplantation. Well, it has many phases. So it's a temporary organ transplantation. It's an infertility treatment. It's a fertility restoration surgery. It's a malformation surgery if you're born without the uterus. But it can also be a reconstructive surgery for the many women who have lost their uterus due to malignant or benign causes. On your left hand side, the image shows a woman that is born without the uterus. She has a syndrome called meyer rokitansky kusterhauser syndrome. You can see in white her ovaries and the fallopian tubes hold by the forceps. And on your right-hand side, you see the same woman where we transplanted the uterus. And the next slide I'm gonna show actually shows a video and it's from Cleveland Clinic. And it just shows the procedure. So here comes a uterus that is attached to the vagina of the recipient. Uh, you see the uterine artery and vein on the sides that is anastomosed to the recipient's external iliac vessels um, bilaterally. So instead of the internal iliacs, the uterine arteries are attached to the external iliacs. But the uterus is placed in the same position as it would have been if it were there from the beginning. So how do you then measure the success and the outcome of uterus transplantation? Well, it's different. It doesn't end with the surgery. So there's a stepwise success in uterus transplantation. And the first is 
the, the of course the, the surgery itself itself the second stage as you see here is the reinitiation of menstruation that is the first demonstration of graft function the third step you have the embryo implantation the fourth step you will have a maintenance of a pregnancy until you come to the fifth step which we actually define as the, the successful outcome of the uterus transplantation that is the delivery of a healthy child from a healthy mother and that time in between the uterus transplantation and the success is more than a year. That's important to remember. So when we look at the cases in the US, so it started the whole journey with uterus transplantation started in 2016 in the US. The first case was done at Cleveland Clinic with a deceased donor. Uh, unfortunately, that case was a failure, a graft failure, and it had to be removed uh, approximately 14 days after the surgery. Cleveland Clinic has since done uh, eight cases and they have a high success rate. We at Baylor uh, University Medical Center also started in 2016. We have a trial that allows for both living and deceased donors, and we have so far done 22 cases at our institution. The third team that's doing uterus transplantation started in 2017, and that is University of Pennsylvania. And they have done both living and deceased donors, and they have done three cases so far. And you can see to date uh, on your right hand side that we have 33 cases performed in the US. So a big portion of the uterus transplantations in the world are actually performed in the US today. When you look at the babies, the first baby was born after a living donation at Baylor in 2017. And then the first baby after a deceased donation was at Cleveland Clinic in 2019. And the first pen baby was also born in 2019. To date, we have 21 babies born in the US alone. This slide is from the OPTN and it just shows the exponential growth of, of uterus transplantation. So it's expected to continue growing. And you can see it has a really good growth from 2017 up until 2019. Then of course the COVID pandemic hit and we have had lower cases as in other organ transplantations, but it's, it's expected to continue growing once the pandemic is, is over. Uh, this just shows you, because uterus transplantation is categorized as a VCA, a vascular composite allograft, and this is the total amount of VCAs done, and you can see the purple represent the uterus donations uh, from living and deceased donors, so the transplanted uteri are the purple in general, and from 2016 you can see that the purple is dominating the field of VCA. So uterus transplantation is today the most common um, type of VCA. And that also, of course, is reflected on the wait list. So these are wait, uh, women awaiting VCAs and the purple uterus taking over the wait list for, for VCAs. So who are we then transplanting and who are the donors in the United States today? Well, the indication for uterus transplantation from the recipient side is, of course, absolute uterine factor infertility. The majority of those 94% is has a syndrome called the MRKH, which is the congenital absence of the uterus. 6% of the recipients so far has had a previous hysterectomy, and these particular ones was for a benign reason, so they had fibromas, but had to be removed when they were in their early 20s. You can see the age of the recipients is in median 31 years. The oldest one has been 43 years. The donors on your right hand side are slightly older than the recipients, 34 years. Important here, of course, for the living donors is that they should have completed their family before they donate the uterus. Most of the recipients and donors so far has been Caucasian. And what I think is interesting too, most of the donors of course have given prior birth, but also you can see in the recipient column here that 18% of the recipients in the US actually has kids prior to uterus transplantation. This is through adoption or gestational carrier or through marriage. But this tells you that it's not only forming your family that's important, but it's also the experience of gestation and childbirth that is important for these women. The donors are interesting too. Uh, as we said before, there's more living donors than deceased donors in uterus transportation in the US today. 64% are living donors. And that is interesting because it's different from the other organ transplantations or VCAs where you kind of base on the, on the uh, deceased donors. You can see here that the donors are from all different regions of the US, and most of them so far has actually been non-directed, meaning that they're not related to the, to the recipients. 
And we have had an enormous interest from donors calling into our institutions. We have had around roughly 800, 900, only to, to Baylor, wanting to donate their uterus to someone they have never met before. And in the picture down uh, below, you see one of our donors with her recipient and the child that came out from the donor's uterus. So if you look at the primary outcomes, what do we report? Well, we report, of course, the, the survival of the recipients and the living donors. We report the graft survivals. We report the live birth rate. And the recipient living donors is so far in the US 100%. When you look at the graft survivals, if you look for the whole period uh, from 2016 up until now, we have a graft survival of, of 76%. But you can also in this graph see the evolution. So in the beginning, we had uh, from both living and deceased donors below 40% success rate, graft survival. Uh, and now since 2019, we have we're closing up on 100% growth survival. And we define the graft failure as the removal of the graft prior to a live birth. And that is, as, as we said, 24% of the recipients. It's equal between living donors or deceased donors. And when do they happen? Well, the graft failures, this is a busy slide, but you see the month uh, on your x-axis. And you, I, I wanna show you to point your attention to the red circle where you have the graft failures. So if you have a graft failure, it's usually early. The median time to graft failure after uterus transplantation is seven days, and the majority is within two weeks. The leading cause has been graft for graft loss has been thrombosis of the graft artery or vein. So once you get over that period, we don't lose many grafts, and we get most of these pregnant. Uh, if you look at the live birth so far, and this is ongoing, of course, because you know it's a stepwise success rate. So some of the recipients that has been transplanted has not reached the, the time of embryo transfer yet. So they, we expect more live birth and an improvement of the numbers I'm going to show you. So 19 recipients so far delivered 21 babies. That means that two mothers delivered twice. The live birth rate per attempted transplant is so far 57% in the US. If you just look at the, the graphs that survive these first two weeks, you have a live birth rate of 76% in those graphs. And that is remarkable in itself, because if you just look at IVF in the general population, they, this is a really good number for, for IVF. 76 success rate after IVF is high. And the uterus transplanted not only has the uterus transplantation, but it also includes IVF. So when do they deliver? Well, the first delivery you can see here marked uh, with the yellow markers normally occurs at a median of 14 months after your uterus transplantation. And the second birth, only two so far, but is at a median of 34 months after the uterus transplantation. So that means that if you only wanna have one birth, you can remove the uterine graft after this first birth, remove it after a little bit more than a year, and the recipient doesn't have to be on the immunosuppressants anymore. Important is also the neonatal outcome. We have, as we have repeated, 21 children. The gestational age at delivery is in median 36 weeks and six days. And you can see here on your left that the majority of the babies are born uh, at a higher gestational age than 36 weeks. A small portion has been born below the age of 32 weeks. Uh, the graph shows you uh, how the evolution has been. We are now treating them more and more as normal pregnancies and deliveries, and we are, uh, we are not afraid so much to wait and to deliver them then later. So you can see the progression is going upwards uh, and we don't deliver so much premature babies anymore. Importantly, in this slide, uh, you see, of course, that the birth weight is, is normal in grams and the birth weight percentile is, is in median uh, the 74th percentile. The gender is evenly distributed in the, in the neonates. They spend some time in NICU afterwards, especially the one that has a preterm delivery. But the most important with this slide, I think, is what you see in the, in the red square below, which is that none of the infants have had to have a surgical intervention within 30 days of life, and none of them had congenital malformations. So the success, I think, and many with me share that opinion, is, is undeniable. The procedure appears to be efficacious. 
It also appears to be without a high rate of serious side effects for both the donor recipient and the child. So what are then the biggest limitations apart from COVID in 2021 to have a wider implication of this? Well, it's not the patient need. In the three centers that have started so far with uterus transplantation, we have had more than 4,000 women applied in three years. Uh, it's not the donors, because we have donors, we have deceased donors, we have a huge interest from living, living donors. It's not the infrastructure, because we have the infrastructure to do this. We have the knowledge, but it is the funding. We do not have funding so far. And how has it looked? Well, institutional funding has been um, covering the three trials that has done cases. So in, at Baylor, it covered 20 cases. So far at Penn, it's going to cover five cases. And at Cleveland Clinic, nine cases. UAB, where Dr. Porritt is from, has also got approved for 25 cases, and they're about to start. But all of this is institutional funding. So the only program so far that has gone from institutional funding to commercial programs is Baylor. And we have now done two cases during 2021 with commercially paying patients. Uh, so if we are going to be able to offer this uh, to more women, and we need to work with policymakers and insurers, and it's a question of women's health, and it's a question of reproductive autonomy. Uh, and it's, it's a larger question too, to get infertility covered by, um, by insurers. That was all I was going to touch base on today. So I think we will have a panel discussion uh, starting that Paige Porritt will lead. Thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you. Outstanding presentations by the both. Thank you to both Dr. Stewart and Dr. Johannesson for those. And I'm going to jump right into the questions. There are a few coming in, and, and you'll have to forgive me because I have my own that I'll intersperse in there uh, <laughs> for our presenters. But Dr. Johannesson, I think I'm going to hit you with a few up front. There's a few questions coming in about um, the non-directed donors and living donors. So one individual wants to understand more about the motivation of non-directed donors, specifically if there's been published work in this area. And secondly, what is the surgery like for the living donors? So we'll start there. So we have started publishing about the living donors and, the, and especially the non-directed living donors, because that's very interesting to me. That didn't have, when I was in Sweden, we didn't have this. Every donor was directed. It was usually the mother of the recipient or a relative. But here, when we came here, all of these women started phoning in and wanting to give their uterus away. And of course, we asked them, why on earth do you want to do this? This is not benefiting you in any way. You won't even know the, the, the recipient. Uh, and most of them, said that they wanted to, experiencing pregnancy and childbirth was so important for them. So they wanted to give this opportunity to someone else. It was more like a gift to someone uh, to experience that. But some of them have also said that they want to contribute to science. Some of them have said that, well, I want to give my uterus away anyway, so I don't want it anymore, so you can have it. Some of them are very happy to get rid of their, their own periods and the hassle with having a uterus too. But the majority of them wants to give away the experience of childbirth and, and pregnancy. And when it comes to this, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that we also see this in women who serve as gestational carriers for unrelated uh, friends, that I'm constantly amazed at the generosity to carry another woman's child, uh, that, uh, you know, again, there usually is some compensation, but it doesn't make up for all that you experience during a pregnancy, and, and many women uh, are uh, very generous to go through this process. So I think it is something we see in other uh, reproductive fields. Um, and also that should just be said also for the living uterus donors that there's no compensation for them. They won't, they are paying their own trips to the institutions. They are covering, covering all those costs by themselves. So, but when we come to the surgery, so when we began doing the living donors, we had, we usually did them as open procedures. So that was a pretty extensive surgery. Uh, they spent about six days in hospital afterwards. It's compared to a, it's somewhere in between a, a simple hysterectomy and radical hysterectomy, more going towards a radical hysterectomy. So it's pretty extensive surgery. Now, the last six, last seven cases actually we've done at Baylor for living donors, we have 
done with, with the help of the robot. That means that it's minimally invasive. We can remove the uterus through the vagina so they have no big scars and they can go home to two days after the surgery. So it's, it's the evolution on the surgical front that we didn't talk about in the presentations has also been massive. Great, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Stewart, a few questions I think you're best suited to answer, which really speaks to the future of uterus transplantation, how important this is to the patients that we serve. Um, one question I think was addressed in part by Dr. Johansson's talk about some of the financial challenges that will have to be overcome and the projection about the demand for uterus transplant. Assuming for a moment, big assumption we can overcome those financial challenges, would you predict that the, the field is gonna be uh, grow, continue to grow on the trajectory that Dr. Johansson showed us in her slides? And then on a related note, uh, second question really is about whether it's time to readdress the ASRM position, which I think this attendee is asking or speaking about the ASRM position paper from a few years ago, that frankly, given how dynamic this field is, how quickly things have changed, um, even with the specter of COVID upon us, um, it, it feels like those are outdated, at least that's my read too, as a, as a participant of, the, of that position paper. Yeah, so great questions. I think um, one issue is that the whole field of infertility medicine is often out of pocket, that there are state mandates and there are some uh, insurers that cover infertility uh, in the same way that they do other medical diagnoses. Uh, but I think that uh, even um, uh, general infertility, IVF, um, uh, surgery for um, uh, uterine problems is, is often not covered or undercovered compared to other uh, medical issues. So uh, I think we're, we do need to lobby insurers, lobby policymakers that women should be treated with parity on these important issues, but it's not exclusively related to uterine transplantation. So again, um, even some of the people that want to do this, they can't create the embryos through IVF uh, to then employ uh, with a uterine transplantation or a gestational carrier uh, because of lack of funding. So I think um, it's a big system-wide issue um, uh, and um, uh, that I think there are components of sexism to the fact that it's, it's not covered. So I think the demand is there, but the finances are very limiting to many, many women. Um, and I would agree with you. I think it's time to update the ASRM um, uh, statement. I think when they uh, conceived of that statement, there really wasn't much activity going on in the United States that the Baylor program was starting, but everybody else was talking about it. Uh, so I would uh, strongly support revisiting that. And Dr. Johansson, back to you. One of our attendees has asked, what is the cost of a patient were to pay out of pocket if their insurance does not cover them? So I think perhaps you can reiterate where the funding for this has previously come from and tell us a little bit about your experience at Baylor being the first institution, if I'm not mistaken, really in the world to bring uterus transplantation forward uh, as, a, as a commercial entity. And then uh, another kind of, I'll call it a series of medical questions. And another attendee wants to know about the immunosuppression that's used, how you diagnose and treat rejection, these types of issues. Mm. So if we go, I mean, the, this is the, the holy grail of the whole thing. How, how much does it cost and who's gonna pay for it? So unfortunately, since we don't have the, the cover of insurance now, we have had to, and the institution could only pay so much. So we had to go to self-pay for our patients now. So we have had two that done that so far. And what we did then was to analyze all the 20 cases we did as a research trial, see what the actual cost was. And then that's the cost we kind of used for this. And the cost for this uh, that they pay is for the whole package. So they pay for the uterus transplantation, the donor surgery, the hospital stay, everything, immunosuppression, uh, pregnancy care, uh, or everything is included in that sum, uh, but it's a very, it's still very expensive. Um, so it's it's around round numbers like it's below three hundred thousand dollars for for doing uterus transplantation, including the pregnancy cost and all of those things. Uh, that you have to compare though to a 
the options, which are the adoption and surrogacy, which are also very expensive procedures. And uh, in a uterus transplantation setting, what you also have to bear in mind is that you could possibly have two pregnancies coming out of the, of the uterus transplantation, whereas you, if you use utilization of carriers, you might have to pay twice or for adoption as well. So it's, it is a huge amount of money and we really want this to get out to more women. We do not want this to be a procedure only for, for the rich. Uh, so again, we need to work with the, with the policymakers and insurance providers. And, and that's a great uh, point that a lot of the hysterectomies experience health disparities. Uh, uterine fibroids, the most common reason for having uh, hysterectomy in young women is uh, more often uh, performed in um, African-American women. So I think uh, that um, uh, by not uh, addressing these issues, we're also letting health disparities continue. Mm, I agree. And if we go over, Paige, you had a question about immunosuppression as well. Yeah, there's quite a few coming in about the immunosuppression regimen, uh, diagnosis and treatment of rejection. So, and that's the, the fact that we, we are feeling the most secure about. So that's the thing that we know a lot about the immunosuppression. So we, uh, the recipients of uterus transplantation are usually on tocolomus afterwards. Uh, they are some, they usually need another agent as well. So they are usually on a CNI, so azathioprine. Uh, this two dose regimen is usually uh, sufficient to keep them from rejection. Uh, the rejection in uterus transplantation is hard to detect. It's always subclinical. So what we have to do is that we have to do cervical biopsies. So during a, an ordinary gynecological examination, you do cervical biopsies for the protocol at times, set time points. And in those biopsies, you can see if there's a rejection coming or not. So we have had rejections and I actually I can show you a slide on that too, but we have had rejections and most of them are within the first three months after uterus transplantation. And when we do detect them, we treat them usually with steroid cycling for three days and uh, no one has lost their uterus due to a rejection episode yet. So we have always been, been able to resolve the rejection episodes that we have seen. The other point, too, is that more and more women are having pregnancies with immunosuppression for kidney transplants and other kinds of transplants. So the, the immunosuppression um, is very similar to what other women who've had transplantation of other organs go through. And what's interesting, I, I feel, sorry, that was Paige. Uh, no, no, go ahead, please. What's interesting is that when you look at these patients, so in the registers for kidney uh, transplant recipients and liver transplant recipients who has given birth before, you can usually see that those women have a higher incidence of preterm birth, they have small for gestational age, uh, they have a higher rate of preeclampsia. When you look at our population of the uterus transplanted females, you don't see that so much. We do have some preeclampsia cases, but the babies are appropriate weight. They are not preterm. So it, it seems like the, the risk factors that we have attributed to the immunosuppression previously might be more the underlying disease of those kidney and, and liver transplanted uh, patients than, than the actual immunosuppression. And that's something, of course, we need more numbers to be able to say, but it, that's how it looks like so far. Great, and I think um, uh, just a plug here, because I see that um, Ms. Lisa Kasha, also a colleague of ours, back in, well, mine anyway, back in Philadelphia, has congratulated both of you on your wonderful presentations, and she wants to, um, she's asking me to make sure that everybody here is aware of the, the Transplant Pregnancy Registry International that exists, and a lot of the data that you were just referencing, Dr. Johannesson, comes in great part from uh, Lisa's work and, and others in the field. So other questions are coming in related to um, the donor selection, uh, both for living and deceased donors. What criteria do you look for? Is there an age cutoff? Uh, Dr. Johannesson, can you speak to these questions? Yes, so that's something that we're learning a lot about. So in the, as I said, the, the, in the trial in Sweden, we had directed donors. And that means that they are usually a little bit older than, than the non-directed donors and the deceased donors. So the first baby that was born that I showed pictures of, he actually had a donor that was 62 years old. So that uterus was on the older side when he got born. 
And so when we were starting to do that here in the US as well, we thought, well, you know, you can use the uterus at any age. So we started with a little bit older donors, but we realized that there's differences in the, the diet, in the genetics here, than you could see in, in, in Europe. So we had a lot more arteriosclerosis, more issues with, with thrombosis afterwards when we used older uteri here. So now we're trying to keep the age down for the uterus. So we usually try at, at the very least have premenopausal donors, uh, prefer to have them younger. So around 40 is better than around 50 because we see that the vessels change. Uh, both when you get older, but also when it's been more time between your deliveries and the donation. Uh, the other thing I think someone asked about was, do they have to have given birth before? And that is not an absolute requirement. Most centers try to find a proven uterus. So we know that they don't have a uterine factor in fertility within that uterus before we transplant it. Uh, but I know that Cleveland Clinic has done two cases where they had used naliparous donors as well. And the process is similar for gestational carriers. The ideal gestational carrier is someone who has had children, but uh, again, a healthy woman who has not uh, may be preferable in certain circumstances. Georgina Waldman wants to know if induction agents are used around the time of the transplant, such as desaliximab or thymoglobulin. And I'll address this as a, a former member of the Penn team. Uh, Lisa, you can correct me, but to my knowledge for the US programs, and I think the majority of the programs in the world, if not all of them have used some type of induction agent. I'm not aware that anyone has done that. I, I mean, to not use induction um, as part of the immunosuppression regimen. Um, another individual asks if you've done a financial analysis. So there's a little bit of, of data here. So keep, keep up with me on this question. In a previous conversation with Dr. Testa, he estimated the transplant cost at about $300,000. Adding in the NICU costs of roughly $100,000, that's a total of $400,000. For an estimated 3,000 possible transplants per year, that's a billion dollars. And this individual points out it's actually the employers who will need to approve this as this is passed down in premiums. So I don't know if there's any additional commentary there, but I wanted to to make that point since there's a lot of questions and comments regarding the cost of uterus transplantation. But along those lines, um, Dr. Stewart, as we wrap up here in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to direct uh, my own question to you. I think um, as someone who's also transplanted individuals and considered many candidates who come forward uh, seeking uterus transplant as an option to build their families, I've been very impressed as a mere transplant surgeon who is not an REI on the multiple layers of, of what infertility means for these patients and what the motivations are that are driving them to pursue this option. One of these, uh, one of these important issues you touched on in your talk, the issue of reproductive autonomy, but I've also been impressed by, I'll call it, frankly, the psychological devastation and the psychosocial impact that infertility has as a disease. And so as I'm Reading the questions that obviously center so much around the cost of this procedure and how we as a community uh, place value on uterus transplantation when it, the, the bucket of resources is limited to take care of so many patients with so many different types of problems. What advice do you have as a practitioner, long lived practitioner in the community of infertility um, for the uterus transplant community about how we can make this argument that there is value and that um, this cost, no matter how high it is, is actually worth trying to, to um, bring down and to lobby for our patients in the different areas we've already commented on. Yeah, no, I think you've spoken very eloquently about that. And in fact, um, the World Health Organization has really started to reframe their thoughts on family planning. For so many decades, family planning was contraception and not being able to have a, um, an unintended pregnancy. Uh, but if you think about it, family planning also means having a family when you want to plan that and being um, unable to. And um, although uh, uh, both unintended pregnancies and not being able to have pregnancies um, affect both men and women, the burden is really disproportionately borne by the woman. And so I think that it is an equity issue. Um, and I think especially 
uh, given um, the fact that age is a much more profound, profound predictor of fertility impairment for women than for men of similar ages. Uh, the fact that we're trying to empower women to uh, participate in their careers and um, uh, that those years also overlap with their childbearing years uh, means we really have to, as a society, support that effort to be able to support the productivity of women in the workforce. Well, there is more to be discussed, I'm sure, but I'm sensitive to the time. And um, I'd like to thank again, both of our speakers and our very outstanding audience for their great participation in today's webinar. I, I certainly learned a lot. I hope everyone else did. Um, and I'll give it back to you for any closing remarks. Thank you. AST would like to thank our panelists and attendees for today's session. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.